Well, good morning. And welcome to our service of worship. It's lovely to have you with us this morning as we join together to praise and worship our great God. And we do pray that this will be a blessed time as we join together around God's Word and sing His praise. Some announcements, uh, more details of which can be found in your announcement sheets. Uh, on Friday evening, ministers received an email from Church House regarding the change in COVID regulations for churches. And given the significant rise of positive COVID-19 cases, the following has been decided. During all services of worship in PCI congregations, everyone aged 13 and over, apart from those exempt, must continue to wear face coverings on entry and exit, and now also during the entire service, apart from them leaving from the front. I.e. face coverings should no longer be removed and seated at a service of worship, and this includes funerals and wedding services. So please do ensure that you wear your face masks throughout the entirety of the service. Now this slight tightening of restrictions in regard to face coverings, while obviously regrettable, is necessary at this time on the strong recommendation of health officials and is now re required by PCI churches. So please do, as I say, continue to wear your face masks. Um, also, given the current circumstances, uh, as a minister, I will not be, I will have to reduce my visitation between going around from different people's houses to keep yourselves and indeed myself safe and um, until things improve a bit more, just so you're aware of that. Um, it's regrettable, but uh, unfortunately it's one of the things that we have we've been warned and cautioned about. But as a current session, we are very grateful for each and every one of your compliance. And um, we continue to pray for guidance and wisdom as we seek to move forward in these very challenging and difficult days. Praying all the while that God would free us from this terrible virus of COVID-19. So thank you for that. Reminder that today is the last opportunity to give towards the work of the Presbyterian Children's Society. Uh, and then as we approach this Advent season and prepare for the birth of the Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ, it's always good to still and focus our hearts and minds on the true meaning of Christmas. And to help us do that, that there are a number of copies of Sinclair Ferguson's Advent devotional book, uh, The Dawn of Redeeming Grace, available in the foyer. Uh, what I've read so far has been very encouraging and helpful, and it should be a good resource as we approach Christmas. Uh, normally they're seven ninety nine, but being a good Balamina man, I managed to get them for a fiver each. So if you would like one, it's a great bargain. Take one and... Uh, Leave, leave, um, I'll leave that to you to, to consider. Our midweek Bible study and prayer meeting continues on Wednesday at 8 p.m. in Orator. Uh, and then the PW then is meeting on Thursday, the 2nd of December, for a music evening. And all ladies are very welcome to attend and come along to that. Then, over the next few Sundays, uh, we will be having a collection. Instead of collecting food and toys for the Prison Fellowship and Belfast City Mission, uh, if you'd like to support the work of either or both of these organisations, uh, would you please use special collection envelopes at the back of your free will offering pack, marking them PF or uh, BCM, and returning them next Sunday, the 5th, or the following Sunday, the 12th of December. Oh, and in advance notice then of our uh, members of committee that there will be a congregational committee meeting held at 8 p.m. On Tuesday the 7th of December and it would be great to have as many members of the committee there in attendance as possible. Uh, then also you'll, you'll probably notice that I have changed the order of service slightly and uh, I'm going to have to take this opportunity just to explain briefly why I have done so. Um, normally we would have, or well, because of Covid we would have had three hymns but I have changed it to have four because I think it's important to have a children's hymn especially after the children's address to include them in the service. Then traditionally the sermon would come after the prayer of intercession, just before the end of the service. However, I feel that God's word is central to everything we believe as Christians. And so therefore you'll notice that I have the Bible reading and sermon bang smack in the middle of the service. And then the prayer of thanks and intercession comes after that as a response to what we've heard. And we're able to tie in those themes that we've been thinking about in the sermon into our prayers of intercession. It's only a slight change. But I know some people have been asking why, and if you have any other questions as to why I do things the way I do, please do feel free to speak to me. I'm glad to help you. So again, that's just a bit of an information. And then we'll meet next Sunday at 12.10. 
This morning as we continue our study in the book of Galatians, we're going to see what it means to walk in the Spirit. How we uh, as believers, as Christians, have been saved by Christ's gospel of grace, and then we are called to live spiritually for Christ in every way. We come to that familiar passage of the fruit of the Spirit, and how as believers this fruit must be evident in our lives. See, Christ's gospel requires spiritual living. We are to walk with the Lord and for the Lord in all that we do. As the psalmist would say in Psalm 42, as our call to worship, as the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, my God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. Where can I go and meet with God? I wonder as we come to worship this morning, do we thirst for the Lord? Do we seek to meet with God? This should be the longing of every believer. And so with the psalmist, let us sing the modern version of Psalm 42. As the tear pants for water, so my soul longs after you. You alone are my heart's desire, and I long to worship you. Let us stand and sing. singing, you alone are my heart's desire, and I long to worship you. Father, we yearn to gaze upon your beauty and perfection. We want to worship you as our all-knowing, all-seeing, all-giving, all-loving God, the one who delights for us, your children, to be blessed. We praise you that today that you are our strength and shield, our rock in which we can depend. Lord, you're the King of all, our Redeemer, our Friend, our Saviour. And to you alone this day belongs all our adoration and gratitude. Yet with the psalmist, we do cry out, Why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? The answer, because we're sinners. 
Father, we want to do good. We want to obey your ways and live for Christ in every way. But we know we can't. Our hearts are sinful. We're wayward in every way. We've thirsted after worldly things rather than good, godly things. We've drunk from the world and not your wellsprings of life. Oh, Father, have mercy on us as sinners. Forgive us in Jesus' name. Help us to once again thirst for Christ and Him alone as the deer pants for streams of clean water. Father, we thank you that when we trust in Christ, His blood washes us as clean. He paid the price needed for our salvation. He enables us to come before you, our great God, with clean hands and pure hearts. Oh Lord Jesus, thank you for quenching our spirit's thirst. Help us only to drink upon the living waters of your word. May we not seek the world, but help us walk according to the Spirit. Oh, Holy Spirit, go before us, we pray. Guide our steps. May we be in tune with your ways. For to you alone my Spirit yields in every way. For Christ's sake. Amen. Well, good morning, boys and girls. It's great to see you this morning. What are hands up when you tell me what I have with me this morning? Anybody know what these are? Anybody know? Yeah, go ahead. Shoes, you're absolutely right. These are my trainers. They're a bit old, but I like to get a new pair. Maybe Sam will bring me a new pair. But you know, over these past few while, I've enjoyed going around the different walks around Order and Clang. And it's been lovely to get out and to get into the fresh air and to go walking. Anybody like walking? Yeah. I'm sure we all enjoy getting out, especially and see all those all, lovely autumn leaves and those colours and all the rest of it. But you know, whenever I was younger, probably around your age, I was quite a big fella. Somebody once described me as long before my time, they used to describe me as Billy Bunker. Do you remember him? That was apparently what I was a bit like. And I used to hate walking, but Mum and Granny used to drag us everyone you could think of. And in a few of those places with me, I wonder can you guess where the walk is. So where is this? Yeah, Port Stir, you're absolutely right. I know that everybody's been up as I was up on Friday and it was unbelievable, the waves. You've maybe been up here, you go to Morelli's for an ice cream, yeah? And then you have to go around the common walk to work off the ice cream, yeah? Right, in Port Stir. Next one. Anybody know where this beach is? It's my favourite place, there's a clue. Anybody know? Nearly, it's the other side of downhill. Castle Rock, you're absolutely right. So there's Castle Rock. And normally on a good day, when the tide's away out, Granny used to march us the whole way from Castle Rock, the whole way to downhill, McGilligan Point, and try and get back before the waves got us or we were going up that hill at downhill. So there you are. Next one. Anybody know where this is? I'll give you, yeah, go ahead. The hill? Where is it? The hill? The hill? No, no, no. I'll give you a clue. There are normally cows on this beach. Cattle, no. White Park Bay. Bay, yes, you're absolutely right. That's White Park Bay, another beautiful place. Next, this is a bit closer this time. Where's this? Ah, uh, everybody knew that one. <laughs> Very good. Never been a lot in my life till I came up this part of the world. Here's the next one. I was here the other day. Where's this? Where is it? Drum Manor? No, not Drum Manor. A wee bit further down the road. Where? No, not Wellbrook. No, no. A wee bit further down towards Oma. Gorson, you're absolutely right. <laughs> Very good. I was at Gorson the other day and I was just loving to be there as well. So there's lots of great places we can walk. And sometimes we go on our own or sometimes we have friends with us. And it's good to go on a walk. Sometimes we need to, to clear our heads and all the rest of it. But you know, boys and girls, as I was thinking about walking the other day, I was going towards the I was thinking to myself, you know, as we are Christians, we are in a walk. It's called the walk of life. And as Christians, we are to walk in the Spirit. We are to walk with God. You see, even though we're on our own walking, we're not really on our own. Because God, the Holy Spirit, is with us, helping us each and every day. One of the things I normally do when I'm on my own and did in Gorgeous Glen was I pray to God and I ask Him for help and strength and all those things. Somebody did ask me, what did you say? And I had to say, well, I was praying and they sort of gave me this kind of look. But anyway, but that's what we're to do. We're to walk and to talk with God. We're to pray to Him. We're to read His Word. We're to go over those 
great things that God has done for us each and every day of our lives. You know, there's an old man in the Bible that talks about in Genesis. His name was Enoch. And he lived 365 years. They lived a long time back in those days. But tell me, how many days is in a normal year? Do you know? Anybody know? How many days is a normal year? Yeah, yeah. 365. So we may not live 365 years, but we have 365 days or 366 in a leap year to walk with the Lord, to talk with Him, to seek His guidance from His Word, and to live for Him in all we do. This is what Paul says. Since we live by the Spirit, let us walk in step with the Spirit. Let us walk according to the way God wants us to, by having time with Him, prayer and reading his word and knowing that he is always with us by his spirit. One, can we say this first and then we'll sing your name after three. One, two, three. Since we live by the spirit, let us walk in step with the spirit. Galatians chapter 5 verse 25. Brilliant. What I'm going to sing your name now it reminds us that when we, put our, we place our lives into, into God, we place our whole lives. Father, I place into your hands the things that I can do. Later on, it talks about, I think it's first three. It says, Father, we want to walk with you and in your presence rest. For we know we always can trust you. Let us stand and sing, Father, I place into your hands. again as we seek to know what it means to be, have life and to spiritually live for Christ in all we do. So lessons chapter 5 beginning in verse 16 and also always we're mindful that this is God's word to us. So I say live by the spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. For the sinful nature desires what is contrary to the spirit. And the spirit what is contrary to the sinful nature. They are in conflict with each other, so that you do not do what you want. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. 
the acts of the sinful nature are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the sinful nature with his passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking and envying each other. Amen. And we do thank God for the reading of his word and we trust his blessing upon it as we turn to it. Well, I wonder how's your walk? I don't mean how you actually walk. I have no doubt you put one foot in front of the other and get from A to B. Some will walk with a stagger, others will shuffle, some will take longer strides. I have a friend who walks like he's got two TVs under his arms. But I'm more interested in your spiritual walk. How is your walk with the Lord? I'm sure we all have different answers. Some of us will be walking well. Others will be driving behind. Some are so busy, 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 running here and there for the Lord. Others will be slouched back, taking a more canny approach. But I think this question is one we all must ask ourselves, myself included. In fact, these concluding verses of Galatians 5 are all to do with our walk with the Lord. Paul, for the past four chapters, has reminded the Galatians of who they are in Christ and what he has accomplished upon the cross. He's reminded them that the law cannot save, only Christ can, because he fulfilled the law on our behalf. Nevertheless, we as believers are to live like Christ in all we do, seeking to follow God's law. However, we know that through Christ's gospel of grace, we're freed from sin's captivity to live as free sons of God. Now, Paul wants to instruct them and us as to how we are to live as believers. In my 1984 NIV, which I use, by the way, in case you're wondering, there's a title that says above it, Life by the Spirit. And really, that's Paul's message here. Christ's gospel requires spiritual living. As we walk with the Lord, we're to live by the Spirit. The Spirit is to be our sanctifier and guide, as we would say in baptismal vows. He fills, equips, and empowers us to live for Christ. And therefore, Paul calls us to be in tune with the Spirit as we seek to walk with the Lord. How? Well, Paul gives us three things to remember regarding spiritual living. Firstly, there are conflicts of spiritual living to avoid. The first conflict is self-righteousness, whereby we try to make ourselves acceptable to God and others by doing good works. But as Begg argues, effective Christian living is not the product of human regulation, but by divine transformation. However, the conflict arises because we want to determine what is good, not God. As Paul has taught throughout Galatians, we are weak and unable to fulfill all that God requires for righteousness, for godly good living. The mind is willing, but the flesh is weak. We know that temptation lurks around every corner and no one is exempt. That's why Paul says, verse 16, So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature or the flesh, as some translations state. And that's the second conflict we're to avoid. Giving in to the sinful nature. Keller writes, there are two conflicting natures at work in the Christian, the Spirit and the sinful nature. As Paul goes on to highlight verse 17, for the sinful nature desires what is contrary to the spirit, and the spirit what is contrary to the sinful nature. 
they are in conflict with each other so that you are not to do whatever you want. Just because we're saved doesn't mean that we won't sin. The difference is we're sinners saved by grace. And this is a message we all must hear. The great preacher, Murray McShane, once said, The seed of every sin known to man resides in my heart. The same is true for us. And therefore, like a soldier in battle, we are to be alert because the enemy is always nearby. However, if the Spirit resides within us, and we're Christians, then we're to daily put to death the sinful nature. As Paul argues, verse 18, But if you are led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. The Spirit sets us free from sin's captivity and the law's bondage. But as we saw last week, just because we're free from the law doesn't mean we are to abuse our freedom. We can't do whatever we want. We must do what God wants us to do. And what God wants is that we walk by the Spirit. Being in tune with God and His Word, allowing Christ's gospel to penetrate every area of our lives so that the sinful nature won't overcome us. Sometimes, however, there's an internal conflict that arises whereby we listen to the Satan's lie. You're not good enough. Or we keep beating ourselves up because we keep sinning and giving in to that temptation. Or we try to work out our salvation and work for our salvation by trying to keep all the law. Martin Luther faced the same conflicts in his life. But he kept coming back to these verses in Galatians 5, 16, 18. And he found hope concluding, Martin, you will never be completely without sin because you still have the flesh. Do not despair, therefore, but fight back and do not gratify the desires of the flesh. We're to fight back. To not allow sin to get a hold in our lives. We're to avoid these conflicts by walking in the Spirit's power who promises never to leave us nor forsake us. So let's not give in to these conflicts of self-righteousness or gratifying the sinful nature. Rather, let us follow Christ, our captain's example, as we walk with the Spirit. Secondly, there's a right conduct of spiritual living to adhere to. In this conflict, says the good Christians need to know the difference between the flesh and the Spirit, the sinful nature and the regenerate nature. And to help us understand what conduct of spiritual living we are to adhere to, Paul firstly outlines a list of things to avoid. Verses 19 to 21a. The acts of the sinful nature are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, and debauchery, idolatry, and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambitions, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. That's quite a list. But notice, Paul warns against obvious sins but also subtle sins. You see, the Greek word for the sinful nature of the flesh is sarx. And sarx encompasses all the sinful acts, words, lust of our lives, but also the subtle attitudes, desires, passions of our hearts. Paul worms against adhering to this wrong conduct of spiritual living. For he continues, and the like. This list isn't exhaustive, for Christ, Paul, and the other apostles give us further warnings on other sins to avoid. You see, we are all sinners, guilty. However, as those saved by Christ's gospel of grace, we are called to avoid this conduct of living. Why? Well, verse 21b, I warn you as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. Those who follow this sinful conduct will never inherit the kingdom of God. The warning is clear. What are we going to do about it? We all need to walk by the Spirit and not gratify the sinful nature, believers included. 
But how? Well, Paul shows us the right conduct of spiritual living to adhere to another list. Verses 22 to 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self control Against such things, there is no law. In comparison to the acts of the sinful nature, it's interesting that Paul speaks of the fruit of the Spirit, not acts. You see, acts are often done on a whim, a fear of fancy. But fruit? Well, it takes time to grow. Think of an apple tree. It first blossoms, then it buds, and eventually an apple grows. And similarly, the fruit of the Spirit takes time to cultivate in our lives. But we must be willing to submit to the Spirit and allow Him to grow this fruit in our lives. And again, notice Paul doesn't use the plural fruits. It's singular. The fruit of the Spirit. For the Spirit does one work in our lives. He makes us more like Christ. So that these nine characteristics or segments of the one fruit can grow. Dugan says the fruit of the Spirit is one whole spiritual life that is rooted in one Spirit of God. This is the conduct of spiritual living we are to adhere to. For you see, each of these characteristics counteract the acts of the flesh. This is how we do battle with the sinful nature. Self-control, counteract sexual immorality, drunkenness, fits of rage with patience, hatred with love. And as we saw last week, faith is evident through love. For all the commandments focus on love, and as Jesus declared, my command is this, love each other as I have loved you. So what kind of conduct are we adhering to? The flesh or the spirit? For thirdly, we have concepts of spiritual living to apply. Paul gives us two concepts or doctrines of spiritual living. Mortification, our daily putting, to, or putting sin to death. And vivification, daily seeking by the spirit to live a godly life. So let's look firstly at mortification, verse 24. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the sinful nature with his passions and desires. If we are saved and the Spirit resides within us, then we're to daily put to death, indeed crucify the sinful nature. Crucifixion was a painful, degrading and gradual death as Christ knew. The idea of mortification or mortifying our sin is seen throughout the Scripture. As Christ himself said, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. Think of sin like a weed. If you only remove the head of a dandelion, it still returns. You need to dig it up, uproot it completely. And the same is true for us. We're to daily uproot, mortify, crucify our sin. As the Romans who nailed Christ to the cross were merciless, so we must be with sin. And yes, it will be painful. Christ experienced that on the cross for our sins. But as the old saying goes, no pain, no gain. If we want to gain glory, we need to crucify our sin. Puritan John Owen wrote extensively regarding mortification, arguing, be killing sin or it will be killing you. We need to crucify our sin or it will kill us. We need the Spirit's empowering help. We need to resolve to uproot our sin and crucify it with Christ. For only then can we truly live by the Spirit. But as we do so, remember that Christ was crucified for all our sins. Therefore, if you belong to Christ, Christ the good, then he has crucified your sinful nature. So do not resurrect it or give it CPR. Leave it on the cross and let it die. For secondly, 
were to accept the concept or doctrine of vivification. Verse 25. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Paul started instructing us to walk with the Spirit. Now he says, keep in step with Him. For when we're in Christ, as we thought with the kids, we're not alone. As we battle and mortify sin by showing the fruit of the Spirit, not the desires of the sinful nature, the Spirit is within us, directing our paths. As I said earlier, when I was younger, Mom and Granny used to drag my sister and I to every wall you could think of. But we used to complain all the time that we couldn't keep up. We couldn't keep in step with them. But as Christians, we need to keep in step with the Spirit. Through prayer and meditation upon God's Word. We're to daily walk in newness of life, bearing the fruit of the Spirit, fulfilling the law of love, says Wilson. Christ has redeemed and saved us from sin upon the cross, giving us life to the full. So let's vividly live as those saved by grace through faith in Christ alone. Let's not, as Paul warns, become conceited, provoking and envying each other. Rather, let's keep in step with the Spirit, according to His Word, in power to walk in glorious life. Calvin argued the death of the flesh is the life of the Spirit. How's our walk with the Lord? Is it in step with the Spirit? As I close, I remember in our BB company section, we had a friend who wasn't able to march in straight lines. And consequently, one of the offers continuously gave off to us that we would never win the drill competition, which we never did, by the way. But anyway, one night us lads decided that we would reshuffle the ranks and our friend would be put in the middle of us. The officer gave the command by the left, quick march, and everyone worked perfectly in step. And similarly, as we walk our Christian lives, we have to remember that we are not alone. The Spirit of God lives within us. And we, ha- and, we follow- and we have fellow believers to help, support, and guide us. When we fall out of step the Spirit, or wander off the track, or give in to sin, or listen to false teachers, we need the Spirit and each other to bring us back in step, moving as one for Christ. Christ's Gospel requires spiritual living by avoiding conflict, adhering to the Spirit's conduct, and applying these concepts of mortification and vivification. Yes, the Christian walk isn't always easy, and we will all trip and fall. But as John declares, whoever claims to abide in him that is Christ must walk as Jesus walked. How's your spiritual walk? I pray is in step with the Spirit. Amen. As a response to God's word, we sing number him, him number 588, I think it is. I want to walk with Jesus Christ all the days I live with his life on earth to give to him complete control of body and of soul. May this be the song of our life.
Father, we are truly grateful for our salvation in Jesus Christ. We bless you that in him we are free from sin and its condemnation. That he has made us alive and enables us to know you as our great God. We praise you for your spirit who works in and through our lives. For his presence leading, guiding and sustaining us daily. Lord, as we've heard from your word today, we pray that we would not gratify the sinful nature. That rather we would mortify and put into death. Help us, Holy Spirit, to walk in your ways all our days, bearing and showing the fruit of the Spirit for Christ's glory. Father, we pray for those in our congregation and community who we know who are not walking in step with the Spirit. Those who perhaps have grown cold in their faith. Those who maybe have an interest, haven't who had an interest in the gospel but are drifting afar. All on the fringes of our congregation, or indeed who do not know you as Lord. Oh Holy Spirit, we ask you to work in their hearts and lives. Would you draw them to yourself? Would you help them to see the futility of a life without you? May they come to saving faith in Jesus Christ and walk with him all the days of their lives, renewed by the Spirit. That even at this Advent season, amidst the darkness of the nights, the people would prepare Christ's room in their hearts. Lord, we're very conscious of the darkness in our world. Whether the darker nights, the rise of COVID, the uprisings in Europe, the natural disasters like we've experienced in the past few days, the wars and rumours of wars across our land, continent and world, the people are simply afraid. We're unsure of the future, not knowing what is next. Father, we pray that you would grant peace in people's souls and hearts, that you would call them to yourself, that we as those saved by Christ's grace would be strengthened and built up in the faith to declare that we trust a God who is in complete control. The King of kings, the Lord of lords, the light of the world who stepped down into darkness to bring peace and salvation. We pray for hope and justice in Jesus' name. That you would thwart the evil and schemes across our world and bring justice to the oppressed, whether that be in Afghanistan, Nigeria, Syria, Europe, or wherever else. Pray for the innocent people living in Afghanistan, Nigeria, Syria, Europe, Myanmar, many other places. Father, we pray for peace. We long for peace. We pray against tyrannical rule, whether that be the Taliban, but Boko Haram, Russia, North Korea, wherever it is, Lord, bring oppressors to their knees, as you've done in the past, and bring an end to their terrible reign of terror. May Christ rule and reign in the hearts of lives of men and women, boys and girls. God, our great physician, we pray for all who have been affected by COVID, whether in recent days or we are still suffering the effects of long COVID, we pray God for healing and restoration, strength and stability, protection for our loved ones and friends. We remember our NHS, giving you thanks for them and their tireless work. Lord, would you bless and keep them, support and help them as they serve on the front line. We're so grateful for them and we pray for more support, whether from us, the public, or our government bodies. Oh Lord, we long for a day when this virus would end. And we pray with end soon. Be merciful to our sinful nation. We know we don't deserve your grace. But as you've done in the past, we pray for your intervention in Jesus' name. Lord, we thank the church and we pray for your church locally and worldwide. We thank you that we have the liberty and freedom to meet in this place and worship your name. Father, we are sorry for when we grumble and we complain about coming out to church. For sometimes we get into the habit of not even coming at all. Oh Lord, forgive us. May we continue to have that desire and see the importance of fellowship with fellow believers. To help us in our walk with the Lord. To guide our steps in righteousness. Father, we just pray that you would continue to go before us. We pray against the lockdown. We pray against another winter without church fellowship. Lord, help us to be sensible. And follow the guidelines before us as we show Christ's love of fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. We pray for your church across the world, especially our dear brothers and sisters who are persecuted even right now for their faith. 
opened doors and asked us to pray for courageous Afghans who have had to flee their country, that they would know God's love and for wisdom and strength for open doors and their partners as they seek to support these refugees in Central Asia. Oh, Father, we pray for them. We pray you would bless their efforts. But we do thank you for those good news stories that despite all the violence and destruction, men and women, boys and girls are coming to faith in Christ. Father, what a joy. But even amongst this turmoil, we pray that it would end. We pray your protection upon them, that you would go before them and bless them and keep them in Jesus' name. And give us compassionate hearts to reach out in love for Christ by praying, giving, and indeed sending people for your harvest fields. Finally, Father, we pray for all in our congregation who have been bereaved in recent days, even during this week. For those who are still raw from the death of a loved one, perhaps in not so recent days. For all who have received treatments and operations, new medications, test results, worrying diagnosis, those awaiting treatment, operations or appointments, God of all comfort, bring strength, we pray. Father, you know each of us and we pray that you would meet us at the point of our need. Touch us in a special way and bring healing and restoration according to your divine will. For Father, we ask all of these things, praying that you would direct our paths and help us to walk for Christ all the days of our life. First in Jesus' name we ask. Amen. We can clear our service together by singing, When we walk with the Lord in the light of his word, and the chorus says, Our refrain, trust and obey, for there is no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. Let us sing.
now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest, remain, and abide with you and your families this day and then forevermore. Amen.